Hello everybody and welcome to another um, edition of Energynomics Talks. We'll talk uh, today with uh, Julian Popov, Chairman of the um, uh, Building Performance Institute Europe, about the uh, energy crisis, energy prices, and how Europeans, especially in Romania and Bulgaria, are preparing to cope with the um, next uh, winter. So stay with us for um, the next um, 40, 45 minutes and find out more. Hello, Julian. Thank you for um, joining me today for this conversation. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. In uh, London, I suppose? I'm in London, yes. Yes, I'm uh, in Bucharest, uh, very hot in uh, these days and uh, uh, nobody, I think nobody talks about the winter. Nobody talks about the uh, problems that most probably we will be facing in just a few months from now. In fact, uh, um, I will start just by saying that the topic that is now um, very important for the companies in energy is more related with the um, government plan and actions to um, ease the burden on consumers. So this um, support measures that are mainly financed by the companies and uh, the money seems not to come from the government at the pace promised. So companies are uh, really stretching out for uh, cash at the moment. And uh, this is not totally decoupled for what we are talking about, uh, we are going to talk about in the next uh, few minutes. Um, so thank you once again for being here and uh, please just a few words about um, uh, the organization you are uh, chairman of. I just uh, had significant problems to <laughs> pronounce the name, but um, Buildings Performance Institute Europe is uh, quite relevant also in this um, conversation. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I chair the board of the Building Performance Institute. This is uh, Europe, which is um, one of the leading think tanks in Brussels and probably the leading one which is working on building policies. And also I'm um, a senior fellow of the European Climate Foundation, which works quite, I mean, across the board of all uh, energy and climate policies in Europe and so beyond uh, Europe and uh, also I sit on several boards of organizations in uh, Hungary, Romania, Kosovo and and few other places uh, which are related to uh, to energy. And some time ago I was uh, environment minister in Bulgaria and then uh, energy security advisor to the president. So I mean I'm saying all these things because um, probably in the conversation I I will look at things from from different perspectives, and uh, uh, I, I hope we'll. Uh, I'm sure I will enjoy the conversation. <laughs> yes, it is. it's very very important background. I will only add that uh, you are voted at least twice as uh, one of the most forty the most influential voice in the European energy policy, and these are uh, details, let's say, that are important for those that are watching us and do not know many about energynomics, about Julian Popov, and it is important for them to uh, make a, um, to have a broader image before we start uh, launching some comments or um, uh, propositions about the um, topic. Uh, this topic is uh, related, start, our idea, this idea to discuss started from your uh, uh, material, you worked a few months ago, uh, some ideas on uh, resource resilience strategy for Bulgaria and then expanded for uh, Europe as a whole and I think that many of those um, ideas are also um, quite appropriate for Romania and um, I would like to um, present some of this idea and uh, maybe try and see um, together if what uh, how many of them would be uh, possible to be implemented if are any in bulgaria for example or in other parts of europe i um, know a little bit uh, better the situation in romania so we can make a little exchange of information on this topic but i will start with this uh, idea where uh, where did it come from where uh, how did you start to work on this um, set of guidelines for a national strategy on resource resilience well, that, that was uh, the instant reaction after the invasion of uh, Ukraine, because um, 
a couple of months after the invasion, we started seeing the um, very aggressive um, language between uh, the European Union and uh, Russia regarding gas, but in and and then the interruptions of gas supplies. First, it was for Poland and uh, and Bulgaria, then for other countries. But in fact, we uh, a year ago we saw that uh, Russia uh, was reducing its uh, supply of gas, and uh, then the expectations and the uh, impression by, of, of many commentators was that th this is more of a um, sort of manipulating prices, uh, just creating general crisis and so on. Uh, now, with hindsight, we can see that this this was probably a preparation for for the war. But uh, once the war started, uh, it, it was quite clear that the already growing crisis, uh, energy crisis in Europe, will become uh, stronger and stronger and more difficult to manage. And one area of uh, action uh, it is naturally to to look at alternative supplies but it is very very important to look also at the whole demand side and um and then i was thinking that we we can address uh, both long-term policies, but at the moment we are entering a crisis which needs to be addressed immediately. And then the question appeared, okay, um, are there things that could be done in six months or in nine months before the winter? What was and, more, more important for you at the moment, the risk that the prices go very much higher or the uh, risk that the uh, supply of uh, energy resources from Russia will uh, stop? Well, I mean, they are related, obviously, uh, th these two things. Uh, the prices in some countries are becoming very, very uh, high. I mean, across Europe are very high. Uh, so uh, UK, for instance, Great Britain is seen as, I mean, one of the richest countries in the world and so on. It is expected that two-thirds of the population of UK will enter the category of energy poverty. So, I mean, this is a kind of slippery thing, how we define energy poverty, but if it's defined as spending more than 10% of your uh, income on energy, then you are in the energy poverty category. So two thirds of one of the, uh, of, a, of a rich country. So uh, obviously the prices are very, very serious uh, issue. They're also pushing and fueling uh, the inflation across the board, which is turning into a, a serious economic crisis. So it is very important to control the, 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 the prices or at least to mitigate these spikes. Uh, and uh, one way to do it is, yes, to look for alternative supplies that uh, uh, could be brought into the market. But the other uh, way, which they, they should be combined, is to look at the demand side, to increase energy efficiency and to reduce um, the whole um, consumption across the board not just on gas but uh, everything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we will um, um, look in more in detail in these um, types of uh, solutions but i will stay a little bit more here because if it's mainly a problem of high prices i maybe um, be able to understand some kind of inactions from the politicians at the moment because at least in part those high prices in romania meant higher profits from some uh, companies for to some specific uh, state owned companies and these high uh, profits uh, allow the state to finance the um, measures for uh, supporting the people in distress because of um, high prices in energy and it seems to be some kind of an equilibrium here at least uh, looking from very far away. 
uh, at the same time, or on uh, on the different perspective, if uh, guests from uh, Russia will stop to come all together, that uh, might be a uh, very uh, different and very uh, more difficult problem, because we might uh, be facing the situation where uh, we will not have enough guests to uh, cover all the needs. And how f how, how s uh, close do you see this particular risk that Russia will stop? Uh, delivering gas during the winter for uh, more countries that they are doing already? Well, the reality is that on 24th of February, uh, Gazprom and the gas production and export of uh, Russia was fully mobilized for military purposes. So, um, which means that everything that Russian gas export would do uh, sort of both through Gazprom, but also uh, LNG export, because Russia has some LNG export, will be following the military objectives of, of Russia. So, which means that it's totally unpredictable, because it's not about guessing whether they have enough gas or they don't have enough gas, or they can sell it somewhere else at a higher price or something like that. Uh, the war in principle is unpredictable venture. So how exactly the supplies of gas will play in, in that uh, is, is very difficult to say. But obviously, we have to be prepared for um, the risk for both um, serious disruptions, uh, but also for uh, total stop. I mean, I think that complete stop of... Uh, supplies is uh, unlikely because um, I mean it would be logical that Russia will try not to completely destroy for the future Europe as a, um, as a client uh, but since the war is is reaching such a dramatic point of unclarity basically and um, the weakness of the Russian army is becoming so obvious, it is quite possible that Putin will, at some point, will throw absolutely everything in, in, in that. And that means that um, gas, uh, total gas supply interruption is also on the map. We just have to be prepared for that. And in order to be prepared for that, we have to build um, um, instant resilience. Mm -hmm. And we have to have a plan, for instance, if there is a total interruption, what are we going to stop first and second and third? Uh, are we going to move into um, I don't know, electricity blackouts or uh, close down whole industries uh, or um, reduce uh, uh, supply for heating? We can't expect that just human behavior will, uh, will absorb such a shock. So that's mm -hmm. why it's very important to have the policies, which are basically wartime policies. I mean, when there is a war, uh, you, you immediately switch to a different regime of managing your resources. And we are in, in this war. We are yes, not yes, and, uh... directly... On, on the battlefield. But However the, the... crazy it sounds, we are talking about the risk of nuclear weapons to be used. So if we are talking about this, <laughs> using gas as a weapon is uh, also a probability we should... Uh, yes, it's a soft option compared yes, to it's a soft many option. Other. Maybe one, two uh, points in, uh, to be made in relation with the Russia uh, part in this uh, uh, crisis. One, is this uh, discussion that Russia is not capable to stop providing gas for Europe totally because the cost for their industry would be um, um, too high. And uh, there are also some information that they are starting to burn the gas instead of selling it to Europe. How do you, how do you what do you know about this? Is this something serious? That, uh, can we talk about significant volumes of gas to be simply burned out? Yes, I mean, um, it, it, as I said, it is a difficult um, a situation and unpredictable. And um, 
And I think that uh, uh, Russia is, is playing very um, kind of complicated game at the moment. And also we have to, to put in the whole kind of picture a few other countries because it's not just uh, Russia to, to Europe but also uh, the Russian relationship with other countries. So um, because Russia can develop, let's say that the Chinese market can be developed quickly. And also for Russia, it's a bit unpredictable, but they can develop it properly be be before 2030. Um, so they're, they're, they're also stuck with, uh, with the gas. Um, then uh, Russia still has uh, the full uh, Turkish market, and uh, that is uh, also a relief. But the other thing, uh, I mean, when we talk about gas in Russia, is that I mean the main revenue, the biggest revenue from uh, Russian export comes from oil. So uh, the problem with gas for Europe is that it's a pipeline, uh, sort of fixed infrastructure delivery. So that gives um, Russia the opportunity to manipulate and to uh, put pressure um, mm -hmm. because uh, the, the alternatives are very, uh, are, are restricted. And we can't, we don't have the um, sufficient LNG um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and also LNG is not um, uh, a, a full replacement for um, for pipeline gas. I mean, that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, if if we become totally dependent on LNG, then we will <laughs> replace the dependency on uh, Russia with dependency on Asia, because if Asia decides to buy a lot of gas and at any price then that increases the price in uh in europe and and it, it has many many other implications also mm -hmm. and shortages of gas in in some poor countries that would need it for their industry and so on and so on so it's a very complicated situation talking about prices we see that we we see at the moment the price of uh, oil brent oil is quite similar with the price before uh, uh, the war starting so it was a high increase then um, uh, decline and now we are um, roughly at the same level uh, uh, at the uh, the start of the year the uh, gas price on the other hand is very 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 much higher it has the record levels today let's say and uh, that is also the situation with the the power prices the electricity prices because they are influenced by the great uh, price of uh, gas so at least from this point of view there is no reason to wait sit and wait <laughs> because uh, uh, things are not uh, going to settle very soon or, le or at least not before this winter and uh, this is uh, another set of reasons that we should act now and um, with this maybe we should uh, try and uh, present each of the um, solutions you um, found there are I think around 20 is up to 20 is, uh, 20 points uh, that uh, govern uh, governments and the population and companies should take into consideration uh, they should have taken into consideration already for months ago but um, also at this moment um, yes indeed I mean the when we talk about the demand side um, and reducing demand, uh, the the solutions and I mean not the full solutions but the partial solutions are basically hundreds uh, because they can uh, we we can focus on every single um, electricity appliance or uh, every single gas boiler, different type of gas boilers. Uh, different insulation uh, measures, uh, um, smart management uh, of of, uh, of energy, and many of these things, uh, the interesting uh, uh, things around, I mean, uh, my paper and the discussions that we had, was that uh, many of these things could be done instantly. Uh, or, or at a very, very short uh, uh, period. So, for example, um, we have uh, made a very quick calculation that uh, if uh, 
the lofts in uh, the building stock in Europe are insulated that will um, reduce um, um, heating um, energy by 14 percent so I mean when you think well what is actually loft insulation loft insulation is something that anybody can do by by himself I mean as long as you're uh, vaguely DIY competent you can go to the shop buy insulation material just laid it on the laid in the loft and you're insulated so this is something that could be done across Europe could be and done you say 14 percent 14 percent of, of of heating this is very uh, uh, close to the 15 percent uh, target uh, the European uh, decided to have it in gas reduction, re reduction yes, consumption. Yeah. Yes, I mean, obviously you can't uh, force everybody to, to do that, but this is the technical potential. And it's one, one solution, could, yes. Very yeah, important. something that could be done very quickly. 10% could be reduced by um, uh, just introducing um, cheap thermostats and also adjusting some thermostats. And, and this is in addition to um, uh, what the International Energy Agency suggested, the uh, reducing temperature by 1%, which, is, uh, which, which could save, I think uh, the calculation was 10, 10 billion cubic meters of gas uh, could, could save. So adjusting temperatures at home, um, then uh, in countries like, I mean, UK has the this so-called condensing boilers. And the, the fact is that most people have condensing boilers on higher temperature. And if this temperature, and if, it, if they're on higher temperature, they don't condense, they, they don't work efficiently. So you have to lower a little bit the temperature. And that means that you need a, mm, information campaign on national media. Mm -hmm. This is the kind is of a, a measure that uh, does not involve uh, spending uh, yeah, money it, from the beneficiary. Yes, yeah? you, <clears throat> it saves money, it saves gas, it saves, uh, it increases security. Mm -hmm. And and the only thing that people have to do is to watch a short video or advertisement on television and then go to their boiler and check what exactly is the temperature then and tweak it a little bit and that has a major effect so this kind of um, measures are very important to be uh, to be taken because uh, they, they just instantly increase efficiency of energy use I mean, many other things can be done. Probably now we're running out of time. But uh, if we think, especially in uh, countries like Bulgaria, Romania, other East European countries, where, uh, but across Europe also, quite uh, a large part of of um, uh, of lighting is uh, still with the old type of light bulbs. I mean, if you have a national campaign for. Uh, changing all the light bulbs, it's changing light bulbs. I mean, you can't think of anything more simple, but an LED light bulb is 10 times more efficient than the old fashioned light bulbs. And we're uh, spending uh, more than 10% of electricity is spent on lighting. Mm -hmm. So you basically, you will save, you can effectively say uh, save probably 15 uh, 5% of electricity and the interesting thing about lighting is that uh, lighting is not just contributing to the overall consumption but it also has a major contribution to the demand peaks because uh, in the evening it's becomes dark and everybody suddenly turns the lights on so it has more than 5 or 10 percent contribution to the to mm -hmm. the overall thing so because it comes when you need it more most but uh, yes. the, i think that it, uh, we are touching here a uh, missed opportunity a very big missed opportunity because uh, talking about this one degree uh, dec uh, decline um, suggested uh, by um, the uh, iea and discussed in romania also i suppose that everywhere in the world uh, it is a very unpopular type of suggestion 
especially when it comes from the politicians or from the authorities. People tend to see it's your job to solve the problem. You cannot pass it over to us and uh, do something that we uh, uh, that brings up uh, bad memories in Romania and Bulgaria and maybe all over the um, Eastern Europe. So uh, this uh, idea was not pushed forward as it uh, was supposed to be because uh, the IEA suggested this very uh, simple idea but how to implement it is very uh, it can be changed it can be different from country to country it can be a top down approach maybe if the government uh, i don't know uh, frees some money for people to uh, buy thermostats for example or it ca- it can come from bottom up if people understand the need the situation and the benefits from themselves and start to buy themselves those thermostats because it is useful now and for the next years but the uh, conversation hasn't start yet in Romania at least yes i mean what the eia did was um basically a model and and you don't communicate things with citizens with models i mean modeling is for economists and for politicians probably but it's it's not for the general public nobody nobody likes models i mean they're complicated and uh, and and also if you just uh give some kind of figure exactly as you said i mean it's it it brings bad memories and say oh well now i, I will stay in the dark and um i did kind of a funny social media it was not an experiment it was just a uh, um uh, post that I, I in bulgaria um i put on facebook a picture of of my jumper and of uh, um, a pair of, uh, of of thick warm socks and a thermometer which was 90 de- showing ni- 19 degrees in my uh room in in sofia just saying well if i don't do that and i i've done that and and my temperature i can i lowered it from 21 degrees to and that was in march from 21 degrees to uh, 19 degrees uh, i'll pay less and i feel fine and i will sleep better and it's healthier for me the funny thing is i mean i posted for for my friends basically as a, almost as a joke and it became a national hit lots of articles if you write my name and then in bulgarian in google and then say socks or jumper and <laughs> the more articles. successful post you had <laughs> yeah. and and then i had uh, interviews uh, uh, i mean i'm i speak on television from time to time so they, they some journalists that know me and they said oh that that's interesting and i had television interviews and radio interviews about my socks and my, about my jumper and nobody said well what are you suggesting that we're going back to communist time and uh, no everybody was i mean this light-hearted um communication which in my case was not some kind of cleverly designed communication it was a spontaneous thing that became viral so uh communication in this case is, is very very important and also you have to not sit somewhere in the international energy agency or european commission or romanian government bulgarian government and say turn the temperature down you have to find a way of of uh, communicating these things in a more lighthearted way and more engaging and and with more solidarity i mean you have to find probably some celebrities or some children or some teacher or something and they will say well i've done that i decided to do it so it works it's up to you whether you'll do it and, or not and then people start thinking and saying what well, what well, i i can do it as well uh, but changing um behavior um economic behavior is a different difficult thing and here uh i i would also advise all, all governments to 
to read the the theory of um, a nudge economy or nudging economy, which I mean, a guy got the Nobel Prize for that, so it's not uh, something to um, ignore. Is uh, how to change behavior not by uh, forcing people through restrictions or taxes, but by nudging them by just kind of gently pushing them in some direction and suggesting things. And that can have a major um, impact. So communication is absolutely vital in this in this situation. Communication and also this uh, uh, maybe a list of uh, easy to implement and cheap solutions so that uh, people who are becoming interested and uh, worried maybe about these issues to find them and uh, choose okay i can change the light bulbs i can uh, buy some thermostats i can buy some insulation and uh, send it to my father in, in the country let's say and help him to uh, um, have a better winter this kind of uh, list would be uh, very very important and also i i think that uh, at the, uh, the authorities level they should uh, somehow uh, coordinate these communication campaigns and they should also provide some uh, build up some programs to help finance because it is much more useful this way than just uh, giving money for covering the difference between a set price and uh, the market price this is a uh, this is not useful on uh, a longer period of time which seems to be in front of us Yes, absolutely. And, and also in communicating things related to uh, personal behavior, uh, there are many things that the communicator doesn't uh, know because we're dealing with different social groups, different geograph geographies, different uh, households, uh, uh, different ages. Uh, so, and uh, you can, I mean, I, I, I did some other calculations about um, uh, tumble dryers. I mean, the machines that dry clothes after uh, you wash them in a machine. And this is something that um, uh, uses massive amount of energy, but massive amount of energy. And, um, and if we don't use them, uh, there is a very simple solution. I mean, you don't use tumble dryer. You just put all the clothes and washing lines, and especially in the in the summer, you can do, and you can save a lot of uh, electricity. You can reduce your bill and so on. But a colleague of mine told me, well, have you thought about all the women who have to uh, wash, uh, cook, and then dry things and then go to work and look after children. I mean, this is a major thing for them that makes their, their life a little bit easier. And I had to say, no, I didn't. I didn't think about that. I did the experiment by myself, uh, but I didn't think about this um, aspect. So you have to kind of test different um, things and also uh engage and and go against certain stereotypes and uh, and maybe say uh okay all men love talking about energy security and big gas pipelines and so on uh what about men trying to dry clothes without tumble dryer i mean that would be a personal contribution to um to energy security so I mean, these things... Need and financial to security of the family, I suppose, because... Uh, energy security of the family, yeah. but also energy security of um, the country. That could, I mean, tumble dryers. Uh, I mean, if you put tumble dryers, washing machine, drying machine, and uh, uh, they're massive um, consumer, and if you manage them more uh, efficiently, but also if you... Uh, if you use them in different times, uh, you can have a much more efficient energy system. And uh, and this could be done very easily with, um, with, uh, with timers. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you can have a plug which uh, you, from your mobile phone, I mean, on Amazon, it costs 10 pounds, this thing. Uh, you can turn your tumble dryer in the middle of the night, for instance, when the, there is no demand for electricity or something like, something else. Yes, and there is also another idea that I think it is important to be highlighted, that uh, 
there are many uh, solutions, many uh, practical actions that we can take, and there is no need to push from all, for all of them to be implemented by everyone. Okay, just list them, make them public, and then every one of us, every individual in this particular context of life we might choose something that works for him, for him or uh, for her. And uh, uh, we should not have exaggerated expectations from uh, people in general to act all together in this direction. This is uh, also, uh, yeah. once again, we're talking about modeling and not about uh, implementing for everybody everywhere. Yes, the, the implementing is, is a very, very different uh, thing. And it's also very human because it affects uh, human behavior. It affects your uh, energy bill. It affects domestic decisions, uh, comfort, and, and, and various other things. So uh, it, it's important exactly not to push it down the throat of everybody, but uh, nudge people encourage them but also create um develop ways that can make uh things easier for them easier to change their own behavior by information by um i don't know if you have a national campaign for changing light bulbs and i don't know give free light bulbs to and also for uh, insulating some uh, there are the uh, the areas right near the windows that's where the uh, yes, heating you are you're losing most and, all, uh, all these things mm -hmm. they they have and then on on other level uh, i don't know the industry the um, uh, public buildings and so on uh, transport uh, uh, where, where government can manage things more directly, uh, then then the government can can be more uh, kind of engaged and and directly acting. Mm -hmm. uh, but one one issue, one problem with this whole idea of of uh, uh, demand management on a national level is that it is complex on one hand, but on the other hand, it needs some kind of a inclusive call i mean if we think in in england uh, during the second world war there was this uh, famous campaign anybody can google it dig for dick victory and dig for victory basically uh, was a campaign during the war in which everybody was encouraged to dig in the garden and and grow their own vegetables and mm -hmm. potatoes mm -hmm. and things because there is a war and um, we have we are, have our jobs here at home to support those uh, in the front line. Yes, and okay. and instead of waiting from the potatoes or something else to come from abroad, uh, and, and and cross the seas where there are German submarines uh, waiting for for ships to to, to blow them up, um, you mm -hmm. use your own garden. And dig for victory is still, I mean, seventy years after the war, is a is a well known story, and and that should be connected, and and such um, policies need to be developed, and and in a very very open way. One one problem you you mentioned at the beginning, uh, why governments are a bit reluctant and not engaged, you know that these are very unpopular things unless you make them inclusive i mean if you say dig for victory you say we're all digging for victory if you say i'm the government you're the consumer you have to switch off your um uh, uh heat listening then... to you i was thinking about the fact that in late february and maybe in march there was i felt a kind of sense of urgency maybe some panic in respect with energy issues and the war in uh, ukraine now i do not feel around my around me or people i know in the streets in the media or uh, in this uh, situation i can't see how such a national world war ii like campaign might uh, uh, start because most of the people do not sense that uh, there is something very uh, difficult very uh, dangerous yeah. happening and uh I don't know exactly where... I mean, this is the sad thing about the war, that, I mean, in the first days, everybody is absolutely shocked. Then everybody is very engaged. Uh, we are 
personally feeling traumatized by every uh, news about uh, um, civilian deaths. Few months later, all that turns into statistics, and and we uh, say, oh, we're very, we're very happy when the Ukrainians advance a little bit, and happy when the Russians advance, and and then we move on to something else. Are um, the things different in Bulgaria, in the, the UK, in this respect? Are people in those two countries you probably know better? Uh, are people more? Uh, I don't know. Aware of the situation of the risk. Um, you mean about Ukraine or about the energy? Yes, but about Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, and the impact on energy. Well, uh, yes, I think both in Bulgaria and in UK and in other countries that I'm been traveling and discussing with people. Um, I mean, the war now turned everywhere uh, in in a fact of of the day so it's it's not um uh, and 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 this is this is a problem because it is a war it is not just a war for ukraine it's a war for uh for our freedom and also for the um for the global order because allowing one country just to invade another country and say okay fine on your doorsteps is is just unacceptable and the outcome of this war will um, decide many things about acceptability of intervention. So it's very, very important for us in defending our democracy and our uh, way of life. And yet uh, at the moment, it, the news on Ukraine war is the 10th or the 12th news in a uh, news bulletin. Tense position. Yes, yeah. it, it, it goes down. And now, uh, I mean, if you, uh, February, March, April, if you watch the um, the news in UK, even if there were no major news from Ukraine, the news would start with Ukraine, what's going on in Ukraine. The news today is that nothing happened in Ukraine, and then you move to, to the next one. Now, even if something happened, you start with the cost of living, the gas prices, the electricity prices, and then you move to Ukraine in the international news. So it's everywhere. The good news is that, I mean, somebody made this point that, uh, yes, I mean, the public uh, kind of got a little bit used to the, the, the whole situation, started living with the war. Uh, but many governments are properly engaged in training uh, uh military personnel ukrainian military personnel sending weapons and everything that uh, they i mean not everything but quite a lot that uh, governments uh, western governments are doing uh especially us poland the the baltic states i mean they're uh they're very engaged and very not just engaged they're contributing all the time uh so th that practical side is is moving it should step up obviously but the impact on our life through the energy uh, prices uh is is taking uh, central stage but we have to to realize that these things are very very connected because um um i mean the energy crisis was not created by the ukrainian war it started before that i mean the ukrainian war just uh, amplified it and prolonged it and it can make it more and more serious for the next year or two i i think after that we will get off uh russian supplies completely yeah and the solution that we are discussing now in this context were also solutions needed uh before the war in ukraine taking into consideration the efforts for um, reducing the impact on the environment and the moving to a green uh, more green uh, society also and uh, you talked earlier about uh, you mentioned some um, other steps maybe uh, a little bit what more uh, costly uh, more expensive uh, introducing renewable uh, generation capacities like Uh, wind or photovoltaics and um, um, pumps of uh, heating pumps and also these are these are solution at uh, large level utility scale let's say 
companies but also for the households and uh, here uh, also a um, kind of support from the authorities uh, would be very much needed in order to cover maybe in part or totally the cost of um, installing such equipments uh, are you familiar with specific programs like this in other countries in europe yes i mean um first in my view, with a great delay, the European Commission came up with um, two major uh, initiatives. One was this Repower EU, and then the next one was the call for uh, an agreement for reducing 15% of the gas consumption. Uh, different countries react on that. So, for example, the Netherlands are very successful in reducing their gas consumption but why they are successful they are successful because for a few years now they have uh, a number of policies for reducing gas consumption because they i mean in the netherlands was one of the countries most reliant relatively on gas in in the eu uh, where th it was o an obligation to connect build new buildings to the gas network uh, but in the last few years, they started very um, um, seriously addressing the, 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 the gas case and moving out of gas. So they were ready for that. Um, Germany was not that ready, but they had also quite a lot of, of, of green uh, policies, other countries, um, other countries too. So wh where my um, sort of criticism uh i mean it's not the job of the commission we can't sit and say the commission has to do all that it's it's the national governments local governments individuals and so on but if if we have to discuss the the measures on eu level i i i have two uh sort of uh, points uh about this measures one is that it was too late i mean we needed one year ago Europe and individual countries had to have emergency strategies ready, prepared, and ready to go, and saying there is something weird going on. Um, gas prices are skyrocketing. The, uh, supp the global supply chain are disrupted, and we saw that when... Um, after the, the lockdowns were removed from COVID. And electricity prices are, are becoming crazy. Uh, coal prices are going up. I mean, I was following the coal prices in China, for instance. I mean, they went mad a year ago. So all these are signals that we have to prepare an emergency strategy if something really bad happened. And it had to be there. At the same time, the um, International Energy Agency made a, a very strong statement that Putin is withholding gas supplies. So this is another, this was another sign that we had to be prepared for emergence. So this strategy had to be ready a year ago, not a month ago. And then at the moment we feel that something really is starting to happen, to start implementing it on a EU level, on a national level, local level. Yes, and this is a criticism much more um, uh, adequately to uh, we were very uh, targeted late. to national uh, governments than Absolutely. to European And we're, uh, we're very complacent. We're very kind of happy with our comfortable life. We complain about everything, but we're very happy with our... Com and we don't want to make any sacrifice. And we don't want to think about the the risk of, of some extraordinary situation. So that, that's that's one criticism. The other criticism that I have is that the especially the second, um, the 15% uh, strategy uh, was very much, not very much, entirely focused on gas. And it, it has to be about all resources and all activities because they are interconnected. I mean, gas is not staying in one box. I mean, if you reduce uh, electricity demand, if you reduce heating demand, if you if you have a more efficient wooden stove, that has a chain impact on other energy um, sources and 
reduction of, of gas use as well. This so correlation this, between sectors is very much present in the uh, uh, restart. Absolutely. And that's why uh, instead of saying everybody has to reduce 15 percent, and, and here we have a, again a communication problem because I mean few people came to me and saying well I, mean, I I can't reduce 15% of my gas use. And I said, well, I mean, nobody asks you to reduce 15% of your gas use. It's the Europe and the country to reduce 15% of your gas use. And the other thing is there is a big difference whether Germany is reducing 15% gas use or Romania, which has uh, gas generation and also gas heating, or Bulgaria, which doesn't have um gas heating uh, apart from district heating and it doesn't have gas generation so countries are different uh but at the same time if bulgaria reduces its electricity consumption that will relieve the um some of the kind of pressure on electricity and it will have a chain impact on uh, eu gas consumption so uh, this this is very important to act in a systemic way and also to act in a very transparent way because transparency in the whole uh, situation is is absolutely essential and also leads to um to further reduction and understanding of the uh, of the mechanisms that that moved the... we talked uh, in detail about the demand side of the problem can we uh, can you have a few comments on the uh, production I, it just came in mind the uh, info that uh, Bulgaria increased its generation uh, with the uh, 19% this year if I uh, power generation 19% which is helpful of course in terms of uh, relieving the pressure on the regional market but um, it is not quite clear to me if it is really helpful on the green targets and in the in the medium term re uh, rebuilding the systems and re um, i don't know repositioning the players so that uh, everything to be more uh, sustainable in near future yeah i mean with the risk to sound a little bit um, kind of flippant and cynical, but um, Bulgaria is benefiting seriously from this crisis because, um, I mean, energy prices are high and this is a big hit on, on business and um, households, but um, Bulgaria, um, it, Bulgarian energy system the coal site is working on absolute maximum capacity and Bulgaria is exporting a lot of electricity. Um, uh, similar as things with, with food and grain and uh, which Bulgaria is an exporter and the high price obviously benefit the country. Uh, and because of the uh, full capacity generation and the high prices, Bulgarian uh, energy companies, which are mostly state companies, so the nuclear power plant, the, 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 uh, the, the main coal power plant, and, and also some um, private power plants, which are with contracts for difference, basically provide a lot of money for, to the budget. And this money could be distributed as compensation. So that's kind of the... The, the the optimistic side specifically for Bulgaria, and and in that sense Bulgaria is is managing relatively well with the whole with the whole thing because the 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 question that you are asking about the the, the green policies, um, yes, there is increase of of coal generation. I think this is uh, on European level there is a little bit of increase, but it's not dramatic. And I don't think we we have to talk about uh, renaissance of coal because there is no renaissance of coal. What is happening, there is available capacity that's fired up. And there is a renewable generation that it, it has not catched up with, with the transition. And if we look what happened in the last 20 years, Europe has the primary energy generation um energy supply in europe has 
declined with 18%. I mean, this is massive. And this 18%, they have to come from somewhere. Okay, the consumption uh, declined a little bit, but let's say 10, 15% have to come from somewhere. And they start coming more and more from import, from gas from Russia. And the exposure of, of, of Europe to import became more and more risky. And that's what we're experiencing now, sudden hit coming from Russia. What we should have done, we should have either delayed the closure of, of some of the power plants or keep them ready to go, ready to work, but not close them, not dismantle them. Or we should have, what would have been much better, accelerate the development of renewable energy so that renewable energy can fill this 18% or at least 10% of this missing energy compared to um to uh year 2000 so that's uh, are there any perspectives uh, any chances that in the next few years we see renewables coming uh, and uh, covering the uh, needed absolutely we're, we're seeing it now with solar and my proposal and my kind of advice to government is to create uh opportunities all opportunities for solar installation in a chaotic way because the government thinking usually is oh no we can't allow solar because uh there is no grid connection i mean leave anybody who wants to install solar with grid connections without grid connection with anything install as fast as possible as much as possible let it develop in a chaotic way so that it can fill this gap and then you can think about the grid connections uh, investors and developers will take their risks. They will take the risk because the energy prices are very high. And what we're seeing now is a massive boom of, of, of solar. One problem is that we still have very delayed and difficult permitting um, mm -hmm. uh, procedures. So the authorities for... are acting like a bottleneck and they are introducing bottlenecks. Yes, and the they, they, they have to, to create opportunities for um, quick uh, permitting procedure, especially for wind, because what might happen in, I don't know, three, four years, we'll suddenly have massive amount of solar, which will start cannibalizing itself in terms of market and prices. And then uh, it, it will not be balanced properly. And the way to balance uh, solar generation is to build uh, uh, wind because they complement each other and also to, to, to develop energy storage and to develop uh, demand side, what we were talking about, the tumble dryers and the, and the mm -hmm. intelligent plugs. I mean, if you have all these components, and this is what I think government should do now, they should push everything in the renewable energy to move very, very fast forward and kind of fix the plane while it's flying. We are very close to um, uh, the end of this conversation. If there is many, uh, maybe one idea or two that you would like to uh, direct to the, uh, the authorities, government, you already did uh, said some uh, something that, but I don't know. Uh, you started to um, write this uh, report, this suggestion, guidelines, having in mind the authorities uh, in order to act properly having seen what they have done during the last months what they should do starting from tomorrow let's say i think first they should call the war war i mean not say there is a war in ukraine we are in a war we are engaged in this war whether we want or not we're engaged in this war we're engaged on the energy side on the supply side on the inflation and and various others and because there is a war, we have to have wartime strategy. We can't deal in a war with a peacetime strategy. So the main thing I think is, is it has to start with, with the language and the honesty of politicians and the risk that this is not very um, popular to say there is a war and we have to do something uh, when people can leave their comfortable life somehow and expect that the government will fix everything and then 
uh, on that basis, they should um, governments should uh, uh, propose um, a, a, a chain of um, a wide variety of demand management and demand reduction policies, uh, which will be um, beneficial for the national system, beneficial for the pockets of the consumer, but we just have to be um, open and, and face the situation. And then we will uh, find, uh, find the solutions and we have to act quickly and deal with the crisis rather than uh, trying to uh, avoid talking about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian Popo, for this conversation, for the effort of uh, compiling those uh, suggestions and also for this idea, some of them not uh, at all very uh, uh, popular or um, easy to find in public spheres not, uh, at the moment. I um, will do my part of the job in order to promote a little bit more these ideas in a future article based on this conversation, also based on your material. And um, let's hope that um, once the holidays are over, the the actions will be uh, many and uh, will be much be uh, better prepared for what uh, the winter will bring us. Oh, yes, the, the, the winter is coming, so we have to act. <laughs> yes, <laughs> winter is coming. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, well, hope thank to you, see Gabriel. you soon. It was it was pleasure to 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 talk to you. Okay, I will have uh, just one moment to uh, remind those watching this uh, conversation that in uh, September 15 we'll be in Sofia with one of the, our events, an genomics uh, regional approach series, and um, if in um, in the city of interested in the relation between Romania and Bulgaria in energy industry, we uh, welcome you there. That, um, that would be all for, um, uh, for today. Thank you very much, Julian. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.